I'll just make sure. Yeah, my name's Penny Kelly. Um, I'm a coordinator for Northern Slopes Land Care based in Bingra. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today um, for today's presentation of beneficial insect populations and the role they play in agricultural landscapes with guest speaker Pippa Jones from Local Land Services. So I'll just be going through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please mute your microphones if you're not in a discussion. Um, and feel free, we had a little bit of a glitch in some of the registration for popping down some questions. So uh, use the comments box at the bottom um, to ask your questions during the presentation. And um, some time will be set aside to answer those at the end of the webinar. So um, just a sh welcome to country. I'd like to acknowledge that this webinar is being held on the traditional lands of the Gomoroi and Bingabu people. And I extend to that to include the traditional lands where you are joining us from today. I pay my respect to elders, both past, present and future. This project is supported by North, Northwest Local Land Services through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. I'd like to thank them and also thank Northern Slopes Land Care Association and the Welburn Plains Land Care Group for making this possible. So I'd like to introduce Pippa Jones, um, Senior Lands Officer with the Natural Resource Management Team. Um, for today's presentation. I'll just be pausing and she'll take over. Thanks, um, Penny. I'll just share my screen. Okay. So you can see my screen now, yeah, my presentation. Yeah. Just give me a yeah. help. Fantastic. So um, now you'll have to excuse me, I am juggling three screens at the moment, which is great most of the time, but when you're doing presentations, it can throw things a bit awry. So fingers crossed it all goes smoothly. Um, as Penny said, I work with Northwest Local Land Services in the Natural Resource Management Team. One of the projects I've been working on the last couple of years through funding from the National Land Care Programme is around improving the health and the connectivity of Brigolo woodland. It's an endangered ecological community um, because where it's traditionally found in the past is, is um, high quality agricultural land. So historically it's been cleared and what's left, um, there isn't much of it left. So we're trying to manage what is left and look after it and improve um, that habitat and also improve connectivity um, for, for habitat for critters and animals um, and also just vegetation health. So under that program, I work have engaged with the CSIRO and a team of um, entomologists and people that work in the pest suppressive landscapes team. Um, and that's so my presentation will be a bit about that project and also looking at some really cool little videos around um, predatory and parasitic insects, um, beneficial insects and how they can um, impact on pests, which is essentially what, um, what we are looking at in this project. So this is a little bug here, this um, groovy little fellow on the leaf that you can see is called an assassin bug. And he's a fairly common predatory bug. So he would predate upon pest insects. Um, keep in mind, I'm not an entomologist, so I keep it fairly high level. Luckily, I work with um, Kate Paul, who you can see in the, in the next slide, and she's pretty amazing at what she does. So as I said, we've partnered with um, CSIRO in 2019. Um, I've worked with Kate, Anna and Andy. Um, they come out from Brisbane and we do some sampling in the field, um, sampling insects mainly in, veg in, in vegetation that's adjacent to cropping systems because uh, we, I guess we want to see what, what lives in the vegetation, where they live in the vegetation um, and, and the sort of populations we've got um, to help inform landholders and the community um, and, and, and 
increase that awareness and understanding, I guess, in, in order to increase the value held by land, landholders um, or the value they place on vegetation. So Kate, who you can see, has a really good history. She's worked as, as an entomologist with the CSIRO. She's got extensive experience in the field, um, undertaking research and monitoring in the Darling Downs. She also does greenhouse trials. Um, and, and in this project, we've got a greenhouse trial in Brisbane, looking at floristic diversity in plants and the types of animals that live in those, or the insects that live in those. We've also got two properties south of Bogabilla, about 50k south of Bogabilla, where we're doing some sampling. Um, border permits permitting and drought and all those sorts of things as well, which has made it a pretty interesting couple of years. So obviously, Kate, um, history is looking at insect behaviour, ecology and movement. And that's what we are looking at in this project. Um, it's also about promoting ecosystem services. So they're the, the free services provided by, in this case, insects, but best by the environment to, to the community and to, um, to cropping and to agriculture. So if it's a pest insect, oh, sorry, a beneficial insect predating on a pest insect, or if it's a shade line provide or a tree line providing shade for stock or a windbreak. Um, those are the types of ecosystem services that we're trying to promote to, to landholders so that they can value vegetation more than just a bunch of trees on their farm that gets in the way of the GPS tractor as it heads up the cropping line. Uh, you can see a photo there of, that's um, Anna from the CSIRO with a malaise trap and essentially the insects at night come into that and then they get trapped at the top of, I guess, the white part of the trap and they go up, um, crawl up because they naturally will head up and then they get um, into a bottle of um, a, a, a liquid um, and Anna takes them back and samples what, what's been caught. So we use that malaise trap. We also use, uh, oh, we missed a slide, DVAC, which is essentially like a reverse leaf blower. Um, you can see Anna's there and, um, that's how you can suck in insects and collect them for sampling. And the other one is beatboxing, which is where you get a little box and you whack a shrub or a tree and have a look at what's in the in the box and, and sample that way. That's really interesting. If you, Anna is um, taking the sampling there and she's pretty amazing. She'll look at something that's a millimetre long and she'll know exactly what it is. So it's always really interesting going out in the field with the CSIRO guys and seeing how they collect insects and, um, and what that tells them about the environment. So they'll know pretty quickly whether there's a lot of beneficials, whether they're really good beneficials or whether they're just sort of fairly standard and whether there's pests in there as well. And at the different life stages as well, I think that's important. Sometimes there's larva and sometimes there's um, the adults and and so seeing that shows you that they're reproducing and maybe increasing populations so that's really interesting as well so i guess part of the thinking is, is um, that we're looking at is obviously we know that um insects live in crops we always hear about the pests insects in crops um but it's also about well where do they live if there are no crops in the ground so if you're a pest insect where do you live if there's no crops um, if you're a beneficial insect, do you live in the crop or do you live in the in the trees? So um, just having that level of thinking, which I, I don't think, I mean, I never used to think to that 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 far. You sort of just think about the pests being in the environment, but they actually have to live somewhere. So that's part of the thinking that we're trying to promote. We've done some field work in the last um couple of years, most recently October last year and then February this year. Obviously the drought had a really big impact on, on insect populations. Um, so numbers overall were, were lower in October than in February that we found. Um, and obviously even in February, we'd had a really good summer. It was um, wet, there was lots of water around. However, um, insects still need to recolonize like everything else. So um, I'd like to think that next time the, the girls and, and Andy come out, 
um, we'll find even more, more insect populations because that's they've just had that little bit of extra time to repopulate. Um, really interesting as well, we don't just find insects in the trees. You sort of think of Brigalow woodland and you think of your, your common tree species, your Brigalow and your Bilar or your poplar box. Um, you've probably also got things like weeping mile in the mid layer. And you've, you've got things like um, saltbush, particularly in the shrub layer and a, a bunch of other ones as well. And it's really interesting that a lot of the bugs actually live in that, that low, lower level of, um, of vegetation. So it really shows the importance of having every single layer within a, within a tree community or within a veg community. Um, we also found things like red and blue bugs, damsel bugs, predatory shield bugs, lace wings, parasitic wasps and spiders. Um, when we sampled, uh, I think it was earlier this year, the February 2021 sampling, there was some flowering brigalow and we definitely found more beneficial insects in the flowering brigalow than the non-flowering brigalow. Um, we didn't have a huge amount of pest insects at the time and that was possibly due to an absence of crop. So October last year, that it, we were coming out of pretty horrendous dry season, so there weren't a lot of crops about. So that might have impacted on the number of pest species we were finding. Um, yeah, so I also have run a few webinars earlier this year on beneficial insects. Um, you'll see on the slide, the one we ran in February was called Beneficials with Benefits, Predators, Parasitoids, and pollinators. So what I'm going to do is I'll sh um, share um, a part of that recording, uh, which is you'll get to listen to Kate <laughs> talk about um, parasitoids in general and really explain that concept really well. But also she and Anna were able to get some videos of insects under the microscope predating on and parasitizing pest insects. And if you're anything like me, um, seeing it makes it really, really meaningful. So I'll um, I'll share that. We had a little bit of a technical glitch earlier, so I'll just have to stop sharing my share screen and then reshare another screen. So just bear with me. Um, Of course, when we did this on Monday, it worked perfectly, but then this, when we've just done it now, it took a little longer. So, um, Penny, I might just need you to tell me if you can see the B. Uh, yes, I can see the B. Yep. You can see the B, great. All right, so I'm just going to play some of Kate's presentation from February. Pollinators. So let's go on to our parasitoids. And once again, I think quite often we say a parasitic wasp, but what does that really, really mean? I introduced you to Hayati here, the silver leaf white flow parasitoid um, at 1.5 mils. But I'd like to now show you just exactly how a parasitic system works. We also have parasitic flies, but the, the things that are more common are our parasitoids. So here's the general life cycle of a cotton boll worm or helicoverpa, moth and its associated parasitoids. So we see the moth up there in the centre, and of course the moth lays eggs in our crop, whether it be sorghum or cotton, etc. And we have egg parasitoids, tiny little egg parasitoids. We also have parasitoids of the caterpillar, and that's probably the most obvious thing that we see that's eating our crop is when the caterpillars start chomping holes through it. And, of course, that caterpillar, in the case of Helicoverpa, will, um, when it matures, drop to the ground and pupate, and then a moth will emerge, and so that cycle continues. If we introduce the parasitoid, what, what's happening there is, and in this case, it's a caterpillar parasitoid. So we have the moth, lays its eggs, caterpillar um, starts to grow, but then the parasitic wasp comes along and injects with a hypodermic needle, injects an egg inside the larvae, and it's not dissimilar to alien, that egg hatches inside of the caterpillar and actually eats the caterpillar from the inside out. Yeah. 
you'll see that um, parasitic wasp will pupate inside the caterpillar. Now, instead of that um, caterpillar turning into a moth, it indeed, um, you will have a parasitic uh, wasp that emerges. So I'd just like to, you know, just in case people are unfamiliar with that whole thing, that's how that system works. And um, without further ado, I think we should go and see um, a parasitic wasp in action. Before I start this video, I just want to point out, this happens very fast. So these um, wasps can deliver many, many eggs. Um, when they inject a caterpillar with an egg, it's a split second. So I'm going to just give you a little bit of a head start here and tell you that just keep watching, but this parasitoid is going to get its ovipositor and it's going to stab this helicobacter larvae underneath its head. It happens really quickly, and perhaps at the end of the um, session today, people, yeah, watch, watch it back. I think uh, people are sending it out to, to all of those people in attendance. Okay, so let's play this video and see what happens to parasitoids and attacking helicobacter larvae. So here we go. I'm just checking out the larvae. Oh, Right under the head, you see that ovipositor now in underneath that helicoverpa egg. So I've just injected an egg into that poor helicoverpa. The helicoverpa larvae is going to wander off now, and uh, that wasp will go off and um, parasitize uh, another another larvae. So the next insect in action, um, I'd like to introduce you to, and perhaps everyone's familiar with surfed or hoverflies, and we have not only in the Brigalow native vegetation, but we also have them around our gardens, and they're quite ubiquitous. There are a number of different species, and they're really quite pretty, and they do have this kind of hovering effect. You can see they're very large eyes, um, so hovering around flowers. And I, sh I should have mentioned in a previous slide that the other reason that we like to provide provision our beneficial insects with um, flowers is because we know um, that um, beneficial insects will live quite often twice as long if they can get their hands on the carbohydrate source. So that will either be nectar, um, sometimes honeydew, which comes from aphids, um, we can talk about that another day, um, or um, pollen. But when we look at hoverflies, this is the adult. The adult's not the thing that's... Um, uh, uh, taking out insect pests, it's actually the larvae of this fly that is the predator. So once again, let's see this action. I'm just going to draw your attention. I hope everybody can see the blue, light blue circle down in the left-hand um, corner of this slide. You'll see that there's a big, or well, two green blobs, um, the circles around the larger of the green blobs. These green blobs are the larvae of that surfed fly. So when we start this video, and um, so this is uh, uh, aphids that are our focus pest here, um, just keep your eye on that blue circle because once again, we'll see this larvae in action and see what it does to um, a poor little aphid. So here we go. There we go, I've got my aphid, and now I'm just going to suck the living daylights out of it, I think. Um, and uh, there it is, and it turns uh, into a tiny, shrunken, dead aphid. So that's how surfed larvae operate. In our final beneficial in action today, we're going to look at um, Dichronolius um, bellus and uh, the red and blue beetle. And once again, um, a, a really fantastic predator that we find not only in native vegetation, but um, when, uh, yeah, crops are at their most, you'll find red and blue beetle um, everywhere um, in northern New South Wales, Brigalow, right up through Queensland, um, and a sensational little predatory beetle. So uh, let's go and watch it in action. So here we are with an aphid again. And I think the thing that we often forget too is that, um, you know, beneficial insects or some of them aren't constrained by time. So if we can increase populations of them in our native vegetation and our crops, we're really getting this benefit that's 24-7. They are out there just motoring through and um, looking for their favourite um, uh, food and, um, and then chowing down on it. So hopefully these three examples have shown you just exactly how that happens. That pretty much brings us to the end of my presentation.
Okay. Just give me a second. I'm just going to swap back to the original um, screen again. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Kate just um, explains it so much better than I do. And those videos are fantastic. A few of you may have watched that um, webinar earlier in the year. Um, I just find it's a really good way to uh, show how beneficial insects work um, in the field. And we, we don't have videos of obviously pollinators, but it's pretty straightforward what they do. They pollinate crops and they're probably the best known. Whereas these parasitoids and predatory insects, um, they're the ones that we probably don't always think of straight away when we think of beneficial insects. Um, yeah, so it's definitely been a really good um, learning experience um, working with the CSIRO and also just um, being able to explain to landholders um, even more so the importance of having vegetation on farm, not necessarily brigolo, every, veg, every type of vegetation would host um, insects. We're obviously focusing on brigolo, that's what our project's about. However, it doesn't matter what vegetation it is, they all play a role in, in hosting beneficial insects or providing ecosystem services um, in, in agricultural landscapes. So I guess some of the key messages that we're promoting to farmers through this project and just through general, um, general discussions um, talks about diverse native vegetation supports numerous beneficial insect populations. And that links back to what I was saying before about we found so many insects in the shrub layer in, and in salt bush, um, similarly in the sort of mid-storey and the canopy species, it's really important um, to maintain health across the whole strata level. And if, if I'm planting trees at home or if I'm talking to farmers about planting trees, we um, try to include some of those mid-storey and low-level species as well, just to add that complexity and that diversity to um, support those beneficial insect populations. Um, something else that... Um, Kate particularly has found over years of research is that beneficial insects more commonly live in native vegetation and, and crops, whereas pest insects are found in weedy areas So and not on the native plants. So that's sort of almost, um, so one of the project um, um, activities we promote is weed control in native vegetation to improve that health. And this is an prime example of why it's important to control weeds. Um, pest insects will be found on those weeds, whereas your beneficial insects will thrive in healthy, non-weedy um, vegetation and obviously also in crops. So um, that's a really good point that is a really clear um, reason for doing that weed control. Um, and the other comment or the other message I guess we promote is that complex vegetation that has plants that flower year round um, benefit insect populations. Kate was just saying in that presentation that if we can have a steady population going 24 seven um, and they can get that carbohydrate source from the sugars on the flowers, then that, um, that increases that pest control almost. Um, and um, so if you've got, a bunch of different types of species in your vegetation and they all flower at different times of the year or not all of them, but there's a good uh, spread of flowering, you're more likely to host um, healthier, more diverse insect populations than if you just had a single species that flowered at one time of the year. So um, that's a really good message as well that I find is really um, uh, helpful in, in when talking to farmers because flowering trees is something that they can and do observe um, quite easily and quite a lot. So um, it's something that's easy for them to do as well. So that's uh, the end of my presentation today. Um, as, as Penny said, the project supported by Northwest Local Land Services with funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Um, thanks to Penny and the Wellburn Plains Group for 
um, inviting me to speak today. It's a really, I've found it a really, really engaging project. I really enjoy going out with the CSIRO team when they go out. Hopefully they'll be here in a few weeks um, to do some more field work. Um, yeah, so, and if you've got any questions about the project or you want to find out more, you might you might have some Brigolo on your place. Um, you might want to um, get involved um, through some on-ground works. We have funding for on-ground works that improve the health and connectivity of Brigolo, including revegetation, weed control, or um, fencing for grazing management, for example. There are my contact details, so please give me a call or send me an email and I can, um, I can get in touch with you again. So Kenny, are there any questions in the, that come, have come up in the chat box? Yeah, no, there isn't. But um, I suppose it's re it is really interesting. Everything plays a part. That's what I'm learning um, so much in my role now is um, regardless of whether you're looking at insects or crops or gardens or soil, there's always um, more than one part to the puzzle. So yeah, very, very interesting. Any, any questions, feel free to write in the chat box or take yourself off mute and um, jump in, anyone. Um, I've just got a quick um, comment slash question, I guess. Um, but yeah, Pip, it'll, it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of this year's surveys, I guess, mm -hmm. to um, um, after having such lush conditions, I guess, for a while now. And so um, when would that sort of information be available, do you think? Uh, so the, the, as I said, the girls, the, I shouldn't call them the girls, they're, um, the ladies, the CSIRR ladies, and, and potentially Andy, who's in charge of the drone, um, will be out hopefully in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and by the time that they... Um, uh, go through all that data and results and get it back to me probably early next year. I think we should have some really good figures around that we can really compare drought or pretty much drought and um, dry times to the 2021 season. So, yeah, and I can definitely, um, yeah, update people on that if they want to want to know. Yeah. Um, and I think as well, um, hopefully in the next little while, we'll have some information from the greenhouse trials, which is looking at the floristic diversity. And um, so that'll be really interesting to let people know about that as well. Yeah. Um, Pip, there is a question that's come through. Do all crops require pollination? And if so, what types of insects? Would you know that off the top of your head? Oh, <laughs> I'm not an entomologist, so my um, my basic understanding, and I'm not an agronomist either, my basic understanding is that crops um, would be just the same as um, a lot of plants and, and pollination is a fairly key part. I can't go into the cropping details though. Things like bees, the carpenter bee, which was the what we started Kate's presentation on, that would be um, an example of a pollinator. Um, yeah, but I probably can't go into the detail of that too much. I'm not sure. And I don't want to give people the wrong information, but I can I can ask Kate um, to give me an example of some pollinators. I can write that down, definitely. Uh, Wayne um, has a question. Um, it's really um, a comment. Thanks, Pip, for your presentation. That was really good. Uh, it's a comment just um, after Penny's question. I mean, all of the grasses, they're generally uh, self or wind pollinations. You don't have to worry too much about those in terms of insects, but certainly any of the, a lot of the other uh, flowering plants that um, are grown as crops, they, they usually have some sort of pollinators. Um, you know, all the canola has been out here in this area just over the last month or so. so. Um, the insects have been pretty busy around there. So it depends on the type of crop, as you said, Pip. Mm. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Wayne. I always like it when we've got participants who um, know their stuff. Are knowledgeable. Yeah, it's great. It's really great. Yes. 
Awesome. Well, um, thanks, Pip. Um, if there's no further questions, I'll ask you to stop your video just so I can 